Day 14. Carl Fairley woke on his homestead at 4.30, as he did most mornings. He stoked the wood stove and put the coffee on. He heard Zeb's horse approaching, and he stepped out onto the porch to greet him. They were having trouble lately with people encroaching around their borders. They had always had hunters cross onto their property occasionally in pursuit of the game they were tracking. And Carl never had a problem with that and usually allowed it without too much consideration. Now, however, they were seeing increased signs of people on the property, particularly in the back section, the furthest from the homestead. A month ago, Carl found a deer carcass with only the head removed, a trophy now hanging over someone's mantle, no doubt. The senseless act troubled Carl, and he wasn't having it on his land. Also, last year he discovered a plot of marijuana growing that was partially over the border onto his land. Now Carl wasn't the kind of man who involved the authorities, if at all possible. He simply burned the pot grove to the ground, stuck a note on a tree on the trail leading onto the plot. It read, My name is Carl Fairley. Your garden was illegally planted on my land. This is your first and last warning. With everything that was going on, he decided it was time to strengthen his borders. He and Zeb were loading the gear onto the pack horse for a trip around the fence line to check the, for breaches in their perimeter and to fortify it where they could. They would be gone several days. Now, he was a bit uneasy leaving the girls and Abigail but they had radios, and he knew he could be home from anywhere on the property in less than an hour at a dead gallop. The two younger boys would remain back at home also. Now, Abigail was proficient in the use of firearms. Her dad had been sheriff in the next county over, and she actually worked in that department before she married Carl. She taught handgun safety and small arms training to the deputies there. She was state certified as an instructor and a range officer. Their daughters all knew how to handle various guns and each one of them specifically knew how to use the 12 gauge that was leaning up behind the umbrella stand to the right of the front door. Carl was confident they would be okay. They had gone off for days before but things were different now. This was a world without rule of law situation. The younger boys thought they were getting a couple days off as Carl and Zeb were heading off to work on the fence line. They found out that they were mistaken when Carl told them to make sure the daily chores didn't fall behind while they were gone. He looked at Zach and said, That pile of firewood I was working out back can use some tending to also, if you have time. Well now, Zach knew that when he said, If you have time, he meant for him to somehow find the time. No, it was not going to be a vacation for him and his younger brother. In fact, it would be just the opposite. Carl climbed onto his horse, and he and Zeb rode off. At the church, we were loading the power wagon and planning on going to the home of Robert and Cynthia Crossman. They were a younger couple who lived just a few miles to the east on a cul-de-sac surrounded by neighbors. When we drove up the road to their house, when we drove up the road that their house was on, we saw three houses burnt to the ground. The one furthest up the road was still smoldering. The Crossman home was intact, but the front door was wide open. We entered in single file with our weapons drawn. We cleared the first floor and started up the stairs. The house so far was empty. Both cars were gone from the garage and we suspected that Bob and Cynthia had both already left for work before the EMP went off. We cleared the upstairs. They were not there. We left a note for them should they return it. It read, Bob, came to check on you November 18th. Friends gathered at hockey rink. Come if you can. Uh, we didn't want to give our location in case the wrong people found the note. And Bob had been a hockey player in high school. And in the winter months, when we assembled the ice rink in the pavilion, Bob came out every Friday night when many members gathered to skate and sit by the fire and drink hot cocoa or cider. He would always attempt to organize the youth group into teams to play hockey. He always took it so seriously. We knew by telling him we were at the hockey rink, he would understand this meant the church. 
We then visited the homes of three other members and found nobody in any of them as well. Similar notes were left, the location clue being individual to each person. Miss Loretta Larson was an older woman who had worked on the church garden. Her note read, Miss Loretta came to check on you November 18th. Friends gathered in your garden. Come if you can. On our way to the next home, on our list, we drove through a small village. In the center of the village was a general store. There were three men sitting on the porch. One was holding a shotgun. It appeared that the store was open for business. We stopped and spoke to the men. They told us that they had some limited supplies for barter, and that we would need to have something to trade for as money was no longer useful or accepted at the store. Greg and I went in to look around, and Richie and Steve and Pastor remained on the porch. The woman behind the counter didn't take her eyes off us the whole time we were inside, and her right hand was out of sight, just below the counter, possibly gripping a shotgun or a weapon of some sort. She was a hard-looking woman, and a chill went up my spine when I saw her glaring at us. I said hello. She just gave a quick nod. I asked her the price for a dozen eggs that sat on a shelf in a display case under the counter. She picked up a notebook and thumbed through the pages. Stopping, she replied, Says here they want kerosene or lamp oil, or they will consider someone to work on their homestead in exchange for two meals a day. I replied we had no lamp oil or kerosene. She promptly retorted, Well, I guess you won't be eating no eggs today then, stranger. Then she said, what you got of value to trade? That was a loaded question, and it was one I didn't want to answer too specifically. I just said, not much. She scowled at me. I told her I had a limited supply of double lot buckshot. She managed a wry smile and said, well, well, do tell. She pulled out a bag of beef jerky, set it on the counter. How limited a supply, she asked. I told her I could part with two boxes, 20 rounds each. She pulled out three large handfuls of jerky, put them in a paper sack, and tried to hand them to me. I looked down at the bag on the counter and said, Well, I put the value of the ammo at about a pound more than what you put in that sack. Again, she scowled as she reached in and took out another large handful and placed it in the paper sack. I smiled and thanked her. She said, Nice doing business with you. Come again, as I headed out the door. Pleasure was mine, I'm sure, ma'am, I replied, as the door struck the bell as I opened it. When we drove off, Richie asked what was in the bag. I told him, I got us some of Carl Fairley's beef jerky, with a smile. Now I recognized the bag she took it from. Abigail had handmade similar ones for most of the ladies in church and gave them out with gifts at Christmas time. They were just simply non-distinct cloth bags made from leftover materials she used to make clothes. She always embroidered an F near the top scene. Richie asked if there was any word about Carl or his family. I said, they're okay. I read on a post on the bulletin board from him advertising firewood. He gave a list of items he would accept and trade for it. Steve was driving and asked if he was on our list. I just chuckled and said, No, sir. The last thing Carl Fairley needs is us to come rescue him. We have more pressing matters. Maybe we'll pay him a visit later. Carl is the one who first made Richie and I aware of our need to prep. The Fairleys lived like it was still the 1800s. Other than a few modern conveniences, you would think you stepped back in time when you went to visit them. They were true neo-pioneers living off the land and the abundance that God had given them. Carl did have an old crew cab F-350 Ford Dooley, which he drove his family to church in. On the homestead, they used horses and wagons, and didn't even own a tractor. He put his kids to work as soon as they learned to walk, and some joked that the reason he had so many was for all the extra help around the farm. Carl was a good, honest, hard-working individual, and he was raising his children to be the same. Everyone knew him, respected him. He loved and supported his community as well. 
Once, a father of a young family down the valley lost his job when the factory he worked in moved overseas. They had nothing. Carl instructed the woman at the store to just keep giving them eggs and honey, and he would settle up with them when, when they rebounded. He and the boys brought them venison from a dairy shop. The young man was proud and would not accept charity. He showed up at Carl's every day at 6 a.m. and demanded Carl put him to work to pay him for what he had given him. Eventually, he lost his home, and Carl took them in for several months till he landed a job out of state and moved away. Carl always maintained that he got the better end of that situation because the young man was such a hard worker. He always said he worked for every single thing I gave him and then some. I was sorry to see him go. That was Carl. He would save your life and then, then make it seem that by doing so you were doing him a favor. When we rolled up on the home of Frank and Jeanette Foster, it was eerily quiet. They lived off the beaten path on a country lane. Frank was a carpenter, had his own small contracting business that he ran out of a barn in the back of his house. Jeanette was a secretary who worked part-time in the first selectman's office. Both were home when the EMP went off. Now they had two kids, both of whom lived out of state. Frank Jr., 21, was in college out west, and Bart, 19, was in the army. We knocked on the door. No answer. We walked around the back and we saw Frank standing over what appeared to be a grave. It had fresh earth on top of it. He was standing there looking down, hat in hand. When Greg called his name, he didn't seem to hear him. Greg called again a little louder. Frank just looked up at us for a moment and then lowered his head again without speaking. Now the well pump didn't work without power and they had to haul water from a creek which was at the bottom of a long, steep bank, about 500 feet from their side door. On day six, while Frank was out hunting, Jeanette descended the hill with two two-gallon pails to fetch some water with to boil for dinner prep. On her way back up, she lost her footing and slipped in some loose gravel. She tumbled all the way down to the brook, coming to rest in the, near the water at the bottom after hitting her head on a rock and blacking out. She regained consciousness almost instantly and picked herself up. She refilled the buckets and went back up the hill. She had a heck of a knot in the back of her head, but other than that, felt pretty fine. When Frank came home from hunting, he walked into the house and found water boiling over on the wood stove. He called Jeanette's name as he slid the pot off to the side. When he didn't get an answer, he walked into the living room where he found her stretched out on the couch. He thought it odd that she would fall asleep in the middle of the day when she had something on the stove. He went over to wake her and discovered she was dead. What he could not have known was that she had a severe concussion and while at the stove started to feel dizzy and nauseous. She went over to lay down and fell asleep and never woke up. Frank had some clues to what happened to her when he examined her and found the softball-sized knot in the back of her head. The details, forever a mystery. He buried her out back in the garden area she loved so much. Greg put his hand on Frank's shoulder and asked, What happened, brother? A confused Frank just shrugged and said, I don't know, as he continued to stare at the grave. I just don't know. Pastor led him inside and they sat at the table. Frank was distraught and didn't take much convincing to get him to agree to come back with us to the church. Jeanette had a fully stocked pantry and Frank had several cans of gas and three cylinders of propane out in his barn. He had guns and ammo and we loaded everything we could salvage into a landscape trailer he had and headed for the church. It was dusk when we pulled in and unloaded the trailer. Our small group now had one more member, one more set of hands to work, one more mouth to feed.